All right, I've got 3.30 on my, on my clock here. So I'm going to say welcome to everyone to this session on transforming open education with regional leaders. Sorry, we have a little visitor here today who has his own thoughts on things. Um, but before the session starts, I have a quick statement to read on behalf of the, the conference. The Open Education Southern Symposium strives to offer an open, inclusive, and friendly environment for all participants. All attendees are expected to help maintain a professional and welcoming environment, free of any type of harassment, by being mindful of the space and the time that you're taking up, being aware of the dynamics of power and privilege, being considerate of others' privacy, being respectful of others and accepting that differences in opinion and circumstance create a stronger collaborative environment, and actively challenging individual biases and assumptions. With that, I'll hand it over to our presenters to begin. Great, <clears throat> Great. thank you so much, Sean. Um, and welcome everyone. Um, I'm Una Daly, the director of the Community College Consortium for OER. And um, myself, and I think I can speak for our panelists, are really thrilled that you decided to join us this afternoon, or, or perhaps you're watching this uh, after the fact. Um, in this session, we're going to share with you the motivation behind the Regional Leaders of Open Education. Um, it was a network that was launched in 2019 to support uh, regional leaders in open education in building their OER initiatives into sustainable programs. So the, uh, the, uh, that, that first initiative worked with community colleges, universities, statewide systems, and library consortia. Um, to work together to solve common challenges that arise in building campus and statewide programs, in engaging policymakers, and building stewardship recommendations um, to support student equity and success, and of course the faculty and staff who work with uh, our students every day. So these are really about furthering the goals of um, those foundational goals of open education. So a lot of work was done in 2019 and 20. And um, we have some panelists, um, Emily and Rodney, who are going to share with you some of that work. Um, and going forward, we're entering a phase two where we've um, engaged with the EMC Foundation uh, to um, formalize our program somewhat and expand the participants uh, beyond kind of established open education community, um, perhaps to institutions that have been marginalized in some way and may, may actually be um, most benefit from the potential of open education. So thank you all for coming. And I just want to mention before I let my panelists introduce themselves is that on the far right is um, Karen Cangelosi, who is uh, our new program director for the Regional Leaders of Open Education. And some of us will refer to that as ARLO. So <laughs> that's the acronym we've used because it was such a mouthful. And we're really thrilled to have Karen. She uh, is a longtime champion of OER. Uh, many of you have met, may have met her at uh, other conferences and listened to her keynotes. And um, she's been a professor at Keene State um, College for the last 29 years. And she focuses and she has focused quite a bit on STEM because she's in biology. So unfortunately, she can't be here today. Uh, but we have several of the folks, um, her new advisors um, who are working on this second leg of the program who will be sharing with you um, not only um, emerging plans, but also really soliciting your opinion. So we hope to just take up half of this with an overview, and then we really want to hear from you on what you think this next, um, next phase should look like. And I'm going to turn it over to Carlos to introduce himself, and then I'll let each of our panelists introduce themselves in turn. Hi, I'm Carlos Scholar. I'm an associate teaching professor in the biotechnology program at North Carolina State University. And I'm really excited about this because I get to see old friends and new friends and um, talk to you about open education. Hi, everyone. I'm Emily Frank, uh, an academic librarian by background and now the Affordable Learning Administrator with Lewis, the Louisiana Library Network, we're an academic library consortium with 47 members here in Louisiana. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Esperanza Zenon. I'm a physics and physical science professor at River Parishes Community College. I'm also in Louisiana. 
And it is a pleasure to be here with you this afternoon. And I look forward to sharing information and letting you share some information with me as well regarding open education. And Rodney? Sorry, I was muted. Um, the, the dreaded Zoom mute. Hey, I'm Rodney Powell. I am the executive director of, the, of our Center for Teaching and Learning at Central Carolina Community College. Um, I also teach chemistry, and I was um, a participant in phase one of the Ar Arlo project um, working on sustainability. So I'm looking forward to hearing what's going to happen in the future. Great. Thank you to all of our panelists for being here and uh, sharing uh, their enthusiasm and, and expertise. So I just wanted to mention that um, the Community College Consortium for OER has um, been around for a long time now. We are a community of practice focused on expanding equitable access to education through lowering cost barriers and empowering faculty and students to succeed through the use of OER and open pedagogy. And um, we have many opportunities for engaging with our members and also with the community in general uh, through our webinars and our listserv and um, many other opportunities, conferences, et cetera, like this. And we thank uh, Stephanie and the rest of the team for, um, for providing this opportunity. And um, we've been working uh, with colleges since 2007. And um, we're really proud to have a large group of folks from our southern region, um, as well as across the country and all the way out to Hawaii and up to Canada as well. So this is, um, this is a movement that's growing and regionally is quite diverse. And I want to just a very quick overview before I get my panelists going here. So as I mentioned, uh, the original phase one was started um, in 2019 and there was four focus areas, sustainability, let me, let me move the panelists, policy and strategy, professionalism, and pol sorry, and the final one was uh, stewardship. And really, it was about collaborating across institutional and state boundaries. We know that some states are a little bit further ahead, some are kind of in the middle, some are still catching up. And so there's so much that we can learn by sharing this information with each other about what's worked. Although we know that there's a lot of differences in states, certainly your policymakers, but there can be so much that can be shared. And so working across the systems, you know, colleges and universities, library consortia, and these government agencies has been really rich. And we thank the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation for supporting that first phase. And the four groups um, all went off and um, came up with projects uh, focused on their specific area. And um, I'm not going to speak about these uh, today uh, in detail, but I, I, you will be hearing uh, about the Arlo Sustainability Guide uh, that Rodney will share with you in just a few moments, and also the professionalism matrix uh, that Emily Frank will be sharing with us shortly. And there was, as I mentioned, there were two other groups, the stewardship group, uh, which worked on a second version of the CARE OER framework that came out in 2018. And that one is still in process, but um, we'll hear more from them later. And the policy and strategy group worked on um, creating a framework uh, for establishing state policy. And in particular, there was three states that, that uh, produced materials and are now in the OER World Policy Hub. So uh, exciting work. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to um, Emily to tell you a little bit about her group that she worked on. Thank you, Una. Um, so I was in the professionalism group. This was led by Quill West, who is the project manager for Pierce College. I'll also note that um, Stephanie, our um, coordinator and convener for the Open Ed Southern Symposium, was also part of this professionalism group, which is to say, I got to collaborate with folks from across institutions, across um, state boundaries, and that was a really fun part of this project. We started with these broad questions, questions around professional development and the skills needed to work in open education, uh, and thinking about um, what are the opportunities that people could use to fill, to address those skills, to fill gaps, and where were gaps present? As we explored this, we asked many adjacent questions like what are the professional practices for open educators? How do people find out about these practices? 
Um, how does a newcomer come into the field? Why should they invest in the field? What do employers evaluate in terms of identifying people who will be successful in open education? So a lot of look, looking at um, professionalism, the roles and the competencies associated with these roles. Next slide. All of these came together in these goals. And um, to meet these goals, we decided to build a matrix of roles within our profession and to think about the competencies related to those roles. At the end of our um, phase one of this work, um, our goal was to, pre to present a working document that demonstrated needs for professional development and um, start thinking about support across our prof profession. Next slide. So to scope things, uh, we decided to begin by limiting ourselves to just a few roles, knowing that there are um, so many roles now involved in um, open education. But we decided to start with the ones that were familiar to us and present in our professionalism group. So specifically, we looked at uh, the role of a librarian, instructional designer, and faculty member. For these three roles, we developed a spreadsheet with a page devoted to each of those roles as that role relates to OER. For this, we looked at um, job ads, some work by others, um, looking at their institution and broadly at job ads and the skills um, vocabulary that goes into those roles and then maps that within this spreadsheet. Next slide. So here is an example of kind of what that mapping out process looks like, looked like thinking about the instructional designer role. Next slide. So all this came together in this resource and I'll share this in the chat in just a moment so you can take a look as well. Um, we found that there is such a strong OER movement, and um, that means that really these are becoming, um, there are open educator professions that are, that are coming. We found so many skills that go into this work. Uh, and I think speaking for myself, but I also think the others involved in the professionalism group, we're excited to see where this matrix goes moving forward in phase two and as others get involved. I'm gonna pass it off to Rodney now to discuss the sustainability group. Thank you, Emily. Um, so, so like Emily said, you know, I was part of the sustainability working group. Our working group was led by Amy Hoffer, who did an amazing job. And you will see um, in a little while, I'll share with you a document that we developed. Um, lots of the, um, while it was written as a group, um, Amy really provided most of the text and, and the framework for what we were doing and helped lead all the discussions. Um, like Emily's group, we had a very diverse group represented um, from people pretty much all over the United States, um, from big, small um, schools, as well as even systems. So why do we need a sustainability working group? Well, this quote by David Wiley, I think kind of sums it up is that, you know, things are continuously changing and that we have to meet those changes in order to make um, OER work for our students for the, um, for the coming years. So um, that's why we wanted to look at sustainability to keep moving forward. So next slide. Um, so the first thing we did was try to identify all the stakeholders in OER that would need to have some sort of concept or idea of how to make OER sustainable for that particular group. Um, for each one of the stakeholders, um, we wanted to identify some of the resources or exemplars of how other people were doing it and what might be useful for them. Um, we wanted to identify the gaps in our knowledge and how to maintain OER at every institution, at any institution. One of the things that we did find through this process, though, is that virtually every institution is different. We all know that in the community college world, right? There's no two that are identical. And therefore, what some exemplar might work at some school and work great at that school, it may not work for you based upon size, location, demographics. There are a number of reasons why it may not work. Um, but 
it at least lets you see how other people are doing things and what gets you started, basically. So next slide. So um, some of the resources that we decided to include, key resources, are things like a guideline or processes. Um, we thought a lot about professional development, some of the different platforms that people are using to publish to OER, um, what types of people are involved and what types of organizations, course finances, vision, communication, all these things are important. Um, I would, um, there is already a sustainability review out there and we used it extensively that was um, published by the SUNY group. Um, I would recommend that you take a look at it as well. So next slide. Um, so what did we focus on? First thing we really try to do is identify what are the gaps and what are the great examples that we have out there for OER sustainability. Then we put together a, or Amy led putting us, helping us put together a sustainability guide, which um, had communication strategies, um, had an advocate guide in it. It also had the timeline that we turned into a Gantt chart to show you what all the various stakeholders are and at what point during the annual cycle do you need, if you're in charge of your OER project, do you need to be holding conversations with each one of these stakeholders on your campus? Um, because every stakeholder has a different timeline, it seems like. And so it's really daunting to think about keeping track of all of that. But if you don't check the boxes in the right order to make sure things are flowing, things will tend to fall apart and it won't be very sustainable for your campus. So um, we spent a lot of time discussing the kind of timeline of things. Um, we also discussed a lot and there is some in the document about students as content creators and helping them become that kind of living, breathing document. Um, and so I will put the link to the document in the chat here in just a second. I think that's what I, all I have for today. So I will pass this off to Esperanza, or am I going back to you? Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to say a, a, a one thing before you pass okay. it off. Thank you so much, Rodney and Emily, for sharing um, that work. Uh, it really amazing work over a year, um, really. And one of the things I'm most proud of about this work <laughs> that uh, I was pretty much just the cheerleader for uh, was um, the fact that we really exemplified open education in the sense that nobody was starting from scratch. We were reusing materials that had already been produced by our community and um, openly licensed materials, both with the um, professional matrix that Emily spoke about. And um, Rodney mentioned the SUNY framework was a big part of guiding that, that, uh, that white paper that was produced um, and all of it, you know, was based on um, either the work of the that had been done at the institutions of the team members or materials that had been released into the open education community. And I think that's um, something that we can all be really, really pleased about. And um, now I, I want to uh, turn this over to the phase two folks. And I just wanted to say, um, as I alluded to earlier, this next phase, we're looking more deeply into the aspects of social justice, anti-racism and inclusiveness, and who may, be, who may be missing from the open education community. And um, Esperanza and Carlos are gonna talk more about that outreach and how we can include and invite um, others, uh, particularly marginalized communities, um, institutions that may be in the, serving those communities to join us. And Esperanza, over to you. So actually, Carlos. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, okay, Carlos, I'm uh, sorry. Well, perfect segue, Una, because um, so when, when I was able to join this um, next phase with Esperanza, uh, we we started by focusing on the values of open education global and um, open education so open education is socially just a public good inclusive accessible affordable and adaptable collaborative so focusing on bringing together people in terms of offering professional development and we'll get into a little bit about that later and facilitated by community and, and stewards in order for it to be impactful. 
So on the next slide, you'll see the phase two leadership team. And uh, Karen is our fearless program director. And we have a variety of members from all types of institutions. So you'll notice uh, community colleges, uh, as well as larger public institutions. And that was intentional so that we could uh, increase the network and um, di disseminate findings. So on the next slide, you'll see that phase two really brings, goes back to these sustainability policy and strategy, stewardship and professionalism um, aspects that were really um, devised and focused on for phase one. And now in phase two, uh, we want to shape the network of leaders by really honing in and revitalizing open education initiatives that support underserved students. And on the next slide, you'll see a list that is by no means comprehensive of how we are looking to support underserved students that include uh, BIPOC students, students with diverse abilities and disabilities, food and housing insecure students, remote rural students, foster care students, students impacted by incarceration, LGBTQIA students, especially those in rural areas, but all student parents, first generation parents. And this is a dynamic list. And with that uh, population that we want to serve and address, uh, the next phase is going to really, yep, invest in open education by strengthening relationships and disseminating resources and communicating resources that promote anti-racism and center on the values of access to education, student agency, and the rights of learners. And just yesterday, I was talking to a group of students about their um, as students as consumers of open educational resources, as well as producers. We'll talk about community and collaboration and keep in mind care, generosity, and generativity with always the lens or the filter of social justice, diversity, equity, and inclusion driving how we um, reach out to other partners and um, uh, instructors. So on the next slide, you'll see some of the program outcomes. And Esperanza is... Uh, thank you, Carlos. So uh, you see here are listed uh, several of the program outcomes for phase two. So uh, we, we, these program outcomes are built on those four pillars that were crucial to the phase one process. And so you see, we also con continue uh, looking at professional development regarding OER. Um, we want to uh, work with our leaders to help develop specialized plans for OER that will work at their institutions so that they can uh, you know, work and meet their goals of serving those students who typically you know, have uh, concerns, you know, the underserved students. Uh, that's a key that we're focusing on in phase two. You know, we're kind of building on those four pillars and drilling into some specifics to, to help meet the needs of those underserved students. Uh, you can see mentorship is important, uh, an important aspect of phase two. And then, um, so, you know, the, the other key thing is that in order for us to, to, to be of assistance to institutions and help them to serve students, we have to have this large, robust network of open ed and DEI leadership peers, right? And, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about that because, um, you know, 
one of the things we want to do in, in this presentation is engage you to help to get your um, you know, uh, take on how we might go about forming that large, robust group of, of professionals. Uh, next slide, please. So as I mentioned, you know, we're trying to build this network. And so what we're working on now is recruitment strategies that will help us to, to get this 90 to 120 leaders across the US and Canada, right? So, you know, we, we want to be able to touch everyone. And you can see here uh, that we do have a focus on HBCUs, Hispanic serving institutions, tribal colleges, and lesser funded institutions, because typically in those environments, you find large pockets of underserved students. But again, this is definitely not exhaustive because this is, a, this is the process that we're in right now. Next slide, please. And so, as I mentioned, um, you know, Carlos and I are serving as advisors who will eventually be working with mentors and statewide leaders, uh, you know, and I kind of think of them as the, the statewide leaders and the folk at institutions as your front line, right? But they've got to have good tools to be able to do what they need to do to help these underserved students, right? And so, um, again, what we're, we're working on is identifying uh, it, uh, existing open ed leaders who are interested in supporting the leadership, uh, supporting this program. Um, and then we're going to, you know, take eight of those individuals and they're going to be uh, more the direct um, mentors to folk at, inst at the institutional level, right, to help them implement the OER plans, right. And then um, some of the statewide leaders will continue in the process and will be available for further support and sharing of resources. Because as um, was mentioned, you know, this is a journey, right? It's not, um, you know, like one and done, so to speak, or you get to an end point. This is an ongoing thing, right? Um, um, so, you know, like, for example, in the QM world, we say that, you know, this is a continuous improvement process and we want to operate in the, with that mindset in, in this phase two as well. Next slide. So uh, this is where we start to reach out to you and have some engagement because we want to, we want your ideas. We know that there are some great ideas uh, for those folks who are attending with us today. Uh, and, and, you know, we believe that because you came to this session, right? You had your, you, you, you had a pick you had your pick of them, and this was important to you for some reason. So we're hoping we can tap into to, uh, your experience and expertise, and you can help us to tackle these uh, three questions. So I'll, I'll focus on the first one here. Uh, if, if you're in the audience now and you have some suggestions for leader recruitment, which is a key portion of phase two, um, feel free to share with us. You can do that in the chat. You can unmute. Uh, we're all ears. Thank you, Esperanza and, and Carlos. And I, I just wanted to say um, the process is if you want to speak, uh, you can, but you're going to need to raise your um, hand, I think, uh, is uh, using the um, reaction um, function in Zoom. And then we will um, unmute you. Um, I believe that's the conference. Um, uh, uh, We've actually um, unmuted them all so that. Perfect. That if all right. So they can just start talking or they can raise their hand if they feel more comfortable doing that. Thank you, Stephanie. That's that's so much easier. <laughs> Don't all speak at once. But we love to hear from you. Uh, I'll kick us off with this um, question about su suggestions for leader recruitment. You know, one thing I think about is um, within Louisiana, within our Lewis Academic Library Consortium, we have a, a list serve that we maintain. Specifically, um, we call it an affordable learning list serve for our members doing that type of work. But I wonder how many other um, academic library consortiums or statewide groups 
have some sort of similar targeted listserv that would be a good tool for leader recruitment. Thank you for that, Emily. That is an excellent suggestion. Yeah, abs absolutely. I, I can see us reaching out to folks who run listservs like yours, Emily, um, and using that as a way to make people aware of this uh, opportunity. So we'll, should we just move on to our next question there? If you, um, I, I, I don't know if Carlos or, or Rodney want to um, share or uh, we, really we do want to hear from the audience. <laughs> uh, we don't want this to be an echo chamber of those of us who are active in the leadership team or, or phase one's leadership team, but um, Yeah, that's a good, good point, yeah. Emily, uh, about list servers and and where to reach out. And I would be interested in in um, learning from the attendees and others on this call to see uh, where else should we be, how should we be reaching out and disseminating. Right. The other thing too is uh, beyond getting recruiting the leaders, we we have to focus on organizing them. And uh, we thought about the geographic model and and organizing in terms of regions, but we definitely like to get your feedback on, you know, how we might organize our the leaders once we recruit them. And don't forget, we're still hoping to hear your ideas about how we might recruit them. Thanks, Esperanza. Yeah, and I, I just was going to add really quickly, the geographic um, suggestion uh, for that was based on pre-pandemic, where uh, we thought there would be an opportunity for people to gather together regionally. And of course, that hasn't happened and probably is not going to happen until next year is my guess, next calendar year. So um, yeah, great question, Esperanza. Yeah. I mean, the organization of the cohorts becomes, you know, there's there's pluses and minuses in a lot of different ways to organize things. Um, one of the, you know, you get a lot of great conversation going on when you get people that are, you know, a whole bunch of librarians in the room at one time or a whole bunch of faculty members or a whole bunch of administrators or, or whatever group. But I think that it also leads to a siloing of their ideas and not understanding how things impact other people. And so um, I'm always in favor of when you form cohorts to have as much diversity in um, position, role, um, and background so that I think that that leads to a, a, a much better understanding of each other and exactly what we all need or what each other needs and it makes a um seems to be more productive for for me at least so i'm going to read a comment in the chat um thank you julie so julie shared for leadership recruitment contacting individuals who were in the cohorts of sparks open education leadership program and the otn or oen um, certificate in open education leadership programs is one idea. Those groups are fairly library, librarian specific, but the most recent Spark cohort includes instructional designers as well. Great suggestions. Yeah, absolutely. I, I wonder if people have suggestions for outside the open education community, perhaps um, networks that are more focused on um, anti-racism or diversity and in, diversity and inclusion um, in higher ed that might um, folks that might be in those networks and perhaps we could outreach to them any yeah i, I could i'll i'll jump in and speak on that because i think that's an excellent idea um, when i when i first started started dealing with oer um, you know, I was very excited about this whole process because of the equity factor. 
And so I was also involved with an organization called NAEP who, that focused on equity. That was their primary focus. And so um, I tried to, uh, you know, in, engage the, the, the open ed side and the equity side to get together and talk to each other because they were really tackling the same issue, but maybe in different specific ways, right? Because uh, that the, the big umbrella for both of those is is equity. And so, um, but there was a reluctance because they saw their work as very different. They didn't think of it as doing the same work. But as you know, over time, we, we are starting to see that uh, open ed is a key uh, factor in, in making education more equitable for, for a great many students, especially the underserved population. So I think that's a great idea. And uh, I, I think also, you know, not, not wanting to steal any thunder uh, from that last question, but I also think by having those that those organizations that are DEI focused, um, you know, knowledgeable and engaged in the open ed movement, uh, you increase the sustainability because uh, a lot of those organizations are um, more directly targeted by federal programs than OER is. And so, I mean, while it is growing in the open ed world, the, the, the federal funding and targeting, uh, those equity organizations have enjoyed that benefit for great, um, you know, for um, many more years, if you will. And so, um, you know, we know that funding is a key in, in a lot of the work that we want to do. And so that's that's a good way to increase the sustainability, I do believe. Absolutely. And I, I want to, Esperanza, I wonder if you would share again, I didn't understand the organization, if you're comfortable sharing that organization that you reached oh, out to. Oh, absolutely. Um, the organization is, is a NAEP, the National Alliance for Partnerships and Equity. And uh, they were very instrumental in writing the Perkins 5 legislation. If, you know, at community colleges, you know, we live and breathe Perkins 5 because that relates to career programs, uh, you know, and, and, and we specialize in that, right? Career readiness, uh, if you will. And so, um, you know, I've worked with that organization for, for many years before I ever knew anything about open ed. But, you know, because early on, I could see the intersection between the two. I tried to get both of them to come to the table and talk to each other, the leadership of both of those organizations. But I think now, um, you know, you get to a point where if you don't partner with other organizations that are doing this work, you don't have sustainability. Absolutely. And, and yeah, um, you mentioned Perkins 5, which was um, passed into law in, eight, in 2018, and it specifically called out for OER this time. So it really provided that opportunity. And so it, it's K through 12 in community colleges. But um, anyone out there from the university that has um, ideas they want to share as well? I think the library networks are, are great ideas. Um, I wonder how we pursue libra libraries at perhaps institutions that haven't yet gotten involved in open education. Um, where would we reach out for those? Well, I would imagine that much like uh, we're doing, that the librarians probably have some type of conference or network or, you know, interest groups across the country that might be a starting point. I, I, I can't speak from a level of expertise because I don't know, you know, what, what actually transpires, but that would seem logical that they do have some type of professional organization or an, an annual conference or of some sort, maybe. Yeah, I'm seeing some suggestions in the chat. I'm just gonna um, read them because they are going to um, you, the, pan the panelists. So um, there was the suggestion of state organizations. It's a great suggestion. And then a link was shared. I'm going to end up um, actually share this with everyone. 
which is the HBCU Library Alliance. Thank you for that. Right. And then And I put in there that um, DOE Title III schools are schools that are addressing at-risk students by trying to improve retention and success. I don't know if there's any type of listserv or any way to get a list of DOE Title III grant recipients within the last couple of years, because OER, I know we weren't successful in the last round of our application, but OER was a major portion of our application. So. Um, that might be a good way to find some people. Yeah, I know other colleges that have used Title III money for their OER programs. So I suspect that's a great idea. And I suspect it's published on the Department of Ed because they publish all of their um, grant programs. Yeah, normally it is. And so it just takes someone the time <laughs> and energy to dig up all this contact information and stuff to do that. So I'm not volunteering, I'm telling you that. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I listening to um, us talk, I realized that, uh, you know, of course, we're because we all come from educational institutions, uh, we, you know, colleges, community colleges or four year colleges, that's the world we typically think of engaging. But if you look at our list of who's underserved, you will see like uh, incarcerated, uh, you know, students of incarcerated parents. Uh, you you know you see some folk on the list that wouldn't you wouldn't typically think of as having a connection to a two year or four year educational institution. So there must be some type of um, structure for reaching out to those organizations as well, right? Um, I mean, there's education that's taking place in prisons and other places every day, and those folk definitely fit the category of being underserved, especially where open ed is concerned, I suspect. So I don't know anything about this organization, um, but the Alliance for Higher Education in Prison is um, a thing. Um, I'll keep looking. Yeah, I, you, you got me on that one. Anita, because uh, that would be great if we had, you know, the more, the more, that's why it's important to have the conversation with you guys, because obviously, uh, you know, some of you know about connections that we don't. Honestly, a lot of this is just looking in Google to see what kinds of associations exist. <laughs> Well, th thanks for that, Anita. And, but I do think um, sometimes having um, connections to the organizations as well is, is really helpful. So if folks do have, um, such as yourself or, or any of the rest of the people here, have connections to those organizations, getting an introduction can be super helpful. Or even working with Achieving the Dream and Richard Sebastian and just get him to, you know, they will gladly share their schools that are members, I'm sure, to try to get those people involved in these activities. So um, that's a good suggestion. Yeah. I, and I've, I've worked with uh, Richard and Achieving the Dream and Achieving the Dream is their focused on equity is really their main initiative. So mm -hmm. that's a, actually an excellent suggestion. And they do publish all their members on their website. <laughs> so, yeah, they do. It's, uh, but I'm sure uh, Richard could be more focused in directing us. So yeah, thank you for that. Another comment in the chat um, from Allison, I think talking to faculty who are preparing future teachers could be another place to to increase reach and impact. Um, so much agree, Allison, you know, one thing that we think about in our efforts is um, ways to expose future teachers to OER. So identifying them as a target group is a great consideration. Yeah, I really love that idea, and and, per, and particularly maybe looking at in those at those uh, schools of ed and so forth that work in marginalized communities that are producing teachers that will go out and work in those communities. Um, and that ties into sustainability. 
back where where we we as I'm qualifying myself as the naive instructor that may not know how to uh, implement OERs or take full advantage of OERs without taking advantage of students. This would be a nice um, connection to make so that we can um, really really teach the teachers and the teachers would teach us. It would be a nice. Uh, we are also in that whole vein of teacher preparation. There are, um, you know, more um, individualized programs that um, college graduates go into to work in those underserved areas. Uh, I don't know if the organization still exists, but back in the day, it was called Teach for America. Mm -hmm. And so th those yeah. organizations have a focus of going into er underserved uh, communities, whether it be in the inner cities or, or rural. Absolutely. Well, as we, I think we're stretching into our last, um, our last four minutes of um, our webinar and um, we're, we're all thrilled that you were able to join us. And now we're just going to put the, the, the big question out here or kind of the umbrella question. Um, what about sustainability? Um, anyone would anyone like to share perspectives on sustainability, um, yeah, particularly uh, when you're looking at statewide sustainability? Um, I know uh, we're many of us are from different states, and each state uh, has support is supporting open ed in its own way. Uh, I, actually, I should say a few states are not yet, but we hope they will be. Um, Thoughts on sustainability from our audience or our panelists? Well, I, as I mentioned, I think that the whole idea of partnering with among, you know, with other organizations can definitely um, help you, um, you know, have a projects and programs that are more sustainable and, and long lived, you know, a lot of things, when the money's gone, they're gone, right? Yeah. And but, I, and uh, we have to get beyond that and the way you can do it is by partnering. Absolutely, and you know, Carlos, I know you're involved in STEM OER, uh, which is, um, I think it's, be, it, it's also about redesign of courses and improving, um, you know, inclusivity for, uh, perhaps, um, you know, marginalized students, underserved students. Do, do you want to share anything about that? I, and I'm, so I teach at, at North Carolina State University and we teach that we, we interact with students from all over the campus in, in the role I'm in. And we teach specific molecular biology courses where textbooks aren't really there. So this is an opportunity because it's such fast pace, um, evolving technologies. This is a really, I see it as a fantastic opportunity to have students be part of the OER process and then share those uh, or share their resources and products with universities and institutions that may not have access to the lab equipment. So in that sense, it's a really exciting way of making it sustainable in the sense that students uh, can help sustain courses where the equipment may not be available. And um, we know that the STEM area um, has been traditionally very, um, white and male in terms of the profession. And so this may be an opportunity to bring in other voices and um, to, to increase that diversity piece that really is at the heart of um, open education and, and Arlo. And I, I totally agree. And it, it, it would help if not only instructors are using and creating um, open resources, but, but also students are producing them from not only big institutions with name, with, with um, 
names and large research projects, but also smaller institutions and colleges. And um, that we all have something we can contribute, I think. And and the libraries are amazing all over. And I think uh, librarians will and have and are catalyzing this by, by raising awareness and teaching instructors about how to do this. So Allison and Sean on this call have really taught me. And absolutely. Oh, and I, I apologize for this. I added the, um, <laughs> I added the email addresses after uh, we started this session. Um, but um, we all would like to uh, hear from you um, if you have ideas after the fact. Let me see if I reload this, I think it'll actually. No, <laughs> sorry. The um, slides that we will be sharing, will have everybody's email address in there. Um, and I know that um, all of us would love to hear from you um, if you have additional ideas um, on how we can um, include uh, perhaps folks from your institution, maybe even you, um, or from other institutions that you know could benefit. Any final remarks from my panelists? This has been uh, quite informative. Uh, I appreciate all of the comments and uh, feedback that was shared with us. Some of the suggestions were absolutely fabulous. So thanks a lot. Don't be I'm afraid saving to the chat. Yeah. Don't be afraid to contact Una or Karen because um, this organization, CCCOER or Open Ed Global or whatever it's called these days, um, is, I mean, the, the group of people I've met through this just in the last couple of years, every one of them is totally welcoming and a great asset to, to our community and always willing to answer any questions and to work with you. So, um, be a part of it. Just volunteer. They'll give you something to do, and you'll <laughs> learn more that you'll learn more than you'll you'll share. That's for sure. So, thank you, Rodney. And we CCCOER, which is the Community College um, Consortium, is part of a international organization called the Open Ed Global. Um, and so, Open Ed Global actually has members in forty nine countries. So. Um, and we have an annual conference every year. In fact, we have one coming up in September. Um, and um, it's a very reasonably priced virtual conference, um, even less, even uh, more affordable for our members. Um, and um, so it's an opportunity to see what's happening in other countries and really on six continents. So, well, thank you so much to uh, Sean and Stephanie for supporting us and for all of you for joining us today. And I hope you have a great rest of your uh, day or evening as the case may be. Take care, everybody. Bye, everyone.